this presentation is about the rainbow revolution, I was asked to talk about the future of transgender rights and having been involved in, as a trans man, in supporting the trans community now for 43 years altogether, um, and becoming a lawyer eventually because, as I put it, I was sick to death of being sacked. Absolutely, I lost so many jobs, and in the end, I thought the only way we will ever change this is by making sure that we know the law, that we actually understand the law. Um, where's my, uh, have I got something to change the thing? Thank you. <laughs> so I want to talk about recent advances, first of all. One of the most important things we achieved... Sorry to interrupt you. Well, right, different mic. One of the most important things we achieved is not just, in the UK, the Gender Recognition Act, but a clear commitment from government to treat trans people as ordinary citizens. So one of, in 2004, the Department of Constitutional Affairs put out a statement on the government website saying, being trans is not the same as having a mental illness. We are distressed by perception of our gender identity sometimes, by the social stigma, by the discrimination, by transphobia, and we can provide professional support. But key was that it is not a mental illness. Ironically, 14 years later, if you wish to obtain gender reassignment treatment, you will still see a psychiatrist first. But we are beginning to see moves now within the National Health Service in England. I mean, one of the great things about living in the UK is we do have a National Health Service and treatment is free. But that does mean you wait for treatment often. Um, but the thing about it now is that this statement has meant so much in terms of changing the way trans people are thought about in the UK. When I think that back in 1975, I was like... I, I put it, the dirt on people's shoes that they wiped off when they went to the building. If I ask a room like this, how many people here know a trans person, every hand goes up. It will be somebody's sister, somebody's cousin, somebody's work colleague. And the one person without a hand up goes, what have I missed? <laughs> You know, so it's, it's a real, real big difference. In 2018, we're now at the stage where 47 nations now afford gender recognition mechanism without sex reassignment surgery. Really important in our campaign was that nobody should be left behind. People who were, had illnesses, people who were disabled, could not necessarily have gender reassignment surgery. Gender reassignment surgery for trans men then was not very good, so most people chose not to have genital surgery. So our key thing in the UK was that it, we should not have to be sterilised. We should. We are entitled to be parents and to have children, and I know many trans men now who have had children in the UK, um, and that we should be able to be private about our bodies. Our bodies are our business. Um, India offers, as you know, a transgender gender status, and I was very fascinated when I was coming to fill in the immigration visa application, and it asked me whether I was male, female, or transgender. And my wife said, for God's sake, put male. <laughs> Let's just get into India. <laughs> okay. And there are some who afford a third gender position, Pakistan, Australia, only eight people in Australia have taken advantage of the third gender position so far. So you see huge differences in cultural settings, massive differences. Denmark, it exists for about a year, but again, very few numbers, but in Pakistan, thousands have taken advantage. So this cultural difference is really key. One of the things that really concerns me though is that particularly at this time of refugee crises all over the world, and actually increasing international travel being accepted by most people as the norm, we are seeing a position where families are a problem. The lack of coherent identity documentation, including in particular adoption 
or birth registration documentation causes huge problems for people. I find in many states that people just would never think of travelling because they cannot clarify their family status. And I remember years ago being offered a job in Botswana. Fantastic professorship, very early, really exciting, but my children weren't my children. So to realise that you cannot make your family legal is really important. That documentation failure arises from a whole series of things, but there's a real failure in definition of who is a spouse or who is a registered partner. So here in the, U in the UK, for example, in England, Scotland and Wales, if you're in a same-sex couple or you're a trans person who hasn't obtained gender recognition, you can still get married to anybody of either gender. But the minute you walk into Northern Ireland, which has a very traditional religious background, they refuse to accept same-sex marriages, so you just become registered partners, which means you couldn't have adopted your children. So you arrive with your children for a job, and you say, oh, hold on a minute. <laughs> They're not actually my children any longer. So there's a limited legal definition of the family, and I think one of the future battles has to be clarifying what family means. It means many things. I was really interested to hear the case um, yesterday about the um, hijra relationship being recognised in law. Um, and I think that sort of set of battles over how we define the family um, for all sorts of reasons, but particularly travel, is really important. One of the most recent cases we've had in Europe is the first, well, only the second case to ever refer to surgical status. This was at the European Court of Human Rights, and it was a French case where France still required compulsory sterilisation. And the court held that the European Convention on Human Rights, um, Article 8, provided an obligation for the state to provide procedures for legal gender recognition without having to comply to unnecessary conditions. And it's encompassed a right to personal autonomy. And this has been the, the big decision we won in 2002, was all stemming around the idea that we were entitled to personal autonomy. The freedom to define one's sexual or gender identity is one of the most essential elements. However, the court went on to say, states could require evidence of the persistence of transsexuality in that person. And this is one of the big debates that has really opened up in Europe at the moment. Do we have to provide evidence to, you know, to, do we have to evidence the fact that we really are of the other gender? Or should we be able to self-identify? I refer to this as being one of the two cases to refer to surgery. One of the things we did in the UK right back in 1992 was we made an absolute commitment and decision to never discuss any individual's surgical status in court. An individual's genital status is only of concern to them, their doctor, and their lover. And that's it. We don't have anywhere in life where we say to people, you know, drop your knickers and let's have a look and see what you are. So why should it affect any other aspects? So why should it just be for one group of people? So we never have discussed surgical status, and I think that was one of the very best decisions we ever made because it is irrelevant now. Okay, it's gender, Jim, but not as we know it. Sorry, I had to put a bit of Star Trek in. <laughs> In 2015, we had a parliamentary inquiry into the UK into transgender equality, a new House of Commons Women's and Equality Committee. And the first inquiry they did was into transgender equality. And you can imagine the women's voices that were risen in opposition to the fact that they were doing this. One of the most interesting things that came out of it was this. The people who responded. We had something like 112 trans people actually write long, detailed responses to the consultation. Lots of short ones, but the long ones. And of these, 15 identified as trans men, 52 as trans women, 
and 67 as having a non-binary gender identity. I was surprised by the figures because they were much higher than I thought. Typical of the person would be, um, this is their code name, for all intents and purposes and legally I'm a woman, often described as a trans woman in particular places, particular times, politically. I used the trapped in the wrong body narrative to get what I wanted, but I don't feel that. I just wanted a different body to the one I had. I felt stressed. Sometimes I didn't, I felt stressed sometimes. I didn't feel dysphoric. I would like to live beyond gender, but that's not possible. It is difficult to pin down what constitutes a woman and a man. Personally, I'm just me. I, many years ago, where a group of PhD students said, so what are you, Stephen? <laughs> are you a woman? Are you a man? Are, you know, what is it? And I said, I don't know. I was a miserable child. I was a deeply unhappy, suicidal teenager. And then I became a Stephen. And whatever a Stephen is, it's turned out actually to be very good, successful, positive experience in life. Does that make me one thing or the other? I have no idea. Because I have skills that come from my social training. I obviously have, in most of my life, I'm just viewed as a man and I'm always being told off at work for being too masculine in meetings. And I love saying, you call me too masculine? The person who's out on the television about having a vagina, and you call that too masculine. So uh, they go, well, you know. <laughs> but it's really important to sort of challenge all those stereotypes of how we are meant to be. But actually, I was not surprised when I saw the... Um, non-binary gender identities. It was interesting because if you looked at those people's individual stories, they appeared very much like a transsexual narrative. They had taken hormones, many of them had had surgery, and they were living in their preferred new gender role. But they still didn't feel necessarily of one gender or another. I think it's important sometimes to reflect on the past. This is a, what Sandy Stone wrote about what it was to be transgender. It meant to pass. We all had to pass. We had to live successfully. We had to be accepted as a natural member of that gender. And I remember so strongly when I first ha saw people, they were saying that I had to become a man and disappear. Disappear. I remember saying, I don't want to disappear from the world. I want to become a man in order to appear. But that was um, incomprehensible. Sandy Stone, this is 1992, she wrote, this is a denial of mixture, the effacement of the previous gender role. In The Empire Strikes Back, which was almost a call to arms in the Western world to, for trans people, she said we had to deconstruct the necessity for passing. We must take responsibility for all our history. This is a political action whereby we re figure and reinscribe our bodies. We reclaim them. And Susan Stryker went on to, in this wonderful paper in 1994, my, my words to Victor Frankenstein, to encounter the transsexual body is to risk a revelation of the constructiveness of the natural order. Confronting the implications of this constructiveness can summon up all the violation loss and separation inflicted by the gendering process that sustains the illusion of naturalness. And of course we had Kate Bornstein. One answer to the question, who is transsexual? Might well be anyone who admits it. A more political answer might be anyone whose performance of gender calls into question the construct of gender again. So what's really key is that we've now seen because of that sort of debate in the, in, I would say, in Western academic literature, we have successfully, as a community, gone, actually, we don't understand gender. We don't think it's real. We think it's only real to the extent that it's used as a tool of oppression by half the world to the other half of the world. And if anybody can actually decide that that isn't what we want and how we want to be, it is us. Anybody can now be 
transgender almost anywhere. So recent threats, and I'll be very quick on this, we had Laverne Cox on the transgender tipping point. Laverne Cox is an actress um, who played in Orange is the New Black on Netflix. Um, and she, it's a radio interview in which she said, I realise this is way bigger than me and about a tipping point in our nation's history. And in England we went, oh, we've had that ages ago. <laughs> but what's really interesting is to see the right-wing press come out in opposition to that statement and say this is actually all about people wanting their delusion to be recognised. But key is how it's been focused on children. That what we are trying to do, almost like lesbian and gay people in the past, is recruit children to being trans. Over and over again, we see that this is about us, and it's, this is the religious argument, you know. This is this mass delusion that we would impose upon society at large, and they produce things like this horrible poster. Please don't confuse me, I'm a girl. Very recently, this year, the government proposed that we have a consultation on self-identification for gender identity. The backlash started immediately. We had all these people, Sheila Jeffries, she's from Australia, what the hell does she know about us? You know? Janice Raymond, she's from bloody Los Angeles, what the hell does she know about the UK? She's never been. And of course, Jermaine Greer, who sadly lives with us, though she is Australian. But what they say has actually motivated a whole new group of what we call trans-exclusionary radical feminists. They believe they're the ones promoting the true transgression of gender. And, and uh, you can read that, I'll give my paper to the organiser, they can send it to. But this is a, a lovely thing, a conversation. So how are we going to abolish genders? How? Just basically abolish it. And a lot of attacking of, this is a parliamentary m member of parliament who supported um, the idea of self-identification, total, total attack on them. And it's all about children, how children are being persuaded to be transgender. Now, in fact, what we've seen is since the change in the law, since the internet, since every child is given a bloody smartphone at the age of eight, they all know about it now. And those who have that identity talk about it. They don't get treatment, but they get counselling. They can get pubertal postponement for the ones who are very committed, and if they choose to transgender in the end. But nobody's giving them sex changes, but you'd think that we were offering sex changes to four-year-olds. So, why should the law change? Well, skip that bit. These are things, things I think are really important when we talk in law. We should never discuss surgical status, it's private. But we should discuss personal autonomy. It's essential to personal development. And one of the things that I think is so important is it enables a good citizen. This is Brandon Tina and his girlfriend. They were murdered in 1994. He had been raped because he was trans. The police told the rapists that he brought a complaint against them, so they went out and killed him and his girlfriend and a couple of other people. His mother brought a case against the state, against the police department, and she won, but the state awarded her only 10% of the damages because they said 90% of the fault was Brandon's for living as a man. So we challenged that, and we challenged that on the basis that Brandon had done the right thing. He had been the good citizen. He had reported the rape. He had taken the risk. And in fact, we won her full damages back. And this is what I think is really important. We have a basic human right to be human beings. I often say to people, you know, I'm a lawyer. I don't give a damn what causes it or how it comes to be. I'm just a lawyer. I'm only interested in the fact that people exist, are human, and are entitled to their rights. So we'll end at that and leave it there. <laughs>